Welcome back to the What's Old Podcast. As always, my name is Brandon. I am here with my good friend, Matt, otherwise known as Rusty the Reseller. And we are here to help you find treasures and teach you how to sell those treasures or maybe the best place to sell those treasures. So uh, Matt and I honestly do not talk about what the show is going to be about. So he always surprises me. And I'm always flabbergasted by the amazing uh, f finds that he has. It, it makes me want to run out and do it. I, I don't think I'd be anywhere near as good at it because I think Matt is the king of all hustlers. But, <laughs> and not in a bad way, not a street hustler, but just uh -huh, working sure. hard. Yeah, I mean, I so, knew what you meant. <laughs> all right. So what do you have for us today, Matt? Oh, by the way, wait. First off, how's it going? You having a, you having a good day, good week, everything going on the resale and market? What's out there? Yeah, no, things are good. You know, it's been it's been kind of chilly um, this week. I've had a lot of I have had a, a decent amount of sales. I've probably packaged up forty or fifty items in the last three or four days, which is you know it's it's part of it. It's not the fun part, right? Uh, you you get excited when you have the sale, and then it's like, well, now I got to find a box for that. Or <laughs> gotta, hey, so let me ask you a question: At what what is the tipping point if somebody's out there? And we talked about on our last show about being what a what sort of what the definition of a professional reseller would be. And I, I simply say it's, I think if you make your living doing it, mm -hmm. you're a professional reseller. But at what is the tipping point in your business? Would you ever hire somebody to do that kind of, I would say grunt work, but you know what I mean, packaging and moving and stuff. Would it ever be worth it to you or is it just part of the deal? It It, it is worth it to me. Um, it would not be worth it to everyone. It depends on how much you do and I, probably the types of things that you sell. Uh, I have in the past hired um, what you would call virtual assistants, and in the first round of doing that, I hired people I you know I had never personally met, but I sought them out on a, on a site that that people it's a pay for uh, pay for service situation, and the way I operated was I photographed everything. And then I gave them a spreadsheet that ex basically told them the parameters of how I wanted a listing to be completed. And then they you know, copied and repeated and operated off that. I did it in batches. I'd give them 100 at a time. I'd say, this is your rate per listing. Uh, when these are finished, you will get paid. And then if you opt to do another batch, then we'll do the same thing over again. And th that allowed me to build up stuff in my store. It also you know, provided a job for someone, which was nice. And it... Um, it it was able you know, I was able to kind of start to build up things in my store much faster because uh, I've copied myself essentially as a worker you know, putting things on. So I've done that, and then uh, more recently I've hired a couple of people locally who have done some work um, for me, and they're actually you know physically holding on to the items and doing a little bit more. But it's worked out. Um, I, I it's good for me. Uh, I think that initially I'm not going to make a whole lot of money from that in the beginning but what i'm gaining is thousands of items put into my store so enough stuff so far enough stuff sells per month that i can pay them for their work i'm not out any money usually the things i'm providing them i have no cost in anymore because i bought it in a lot i've already made my money back on it and then so there's a, there's the the monetary amount to pay them to do it but in six eight months ten months from now i might have ten thousand items in my store which the the amount of time that it would take to do that, it's very much worth it because I will, I will see the monetary gain eventually on that. What about the shipping stuff, like the physical? You know, you have people take pictures of it and 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 post it, but what about the actual shipping? Is that ever going to be? Is there ever a point? Can you see where you have some assistant who their main job is to do just what you're naming, and they ship stuff out for you, so you're not actually having to box things up and go run it over to the different places? Yeah. I mean, the hope is that I can do that. I think the threshold for me will be when I'm earning enough revenue from the these different uh, content creation avenues that I've sort of initiated um, and or other side hustles that I've got going. If I can <laughs> do that, then I can push off most of the stuff from my selling onto some. I, I, I think that I can teach them and I think that the, the business can afford to to have employees to do that. I would want to keep them contractors as contractors initially just because of the added cost if you're going to pay right. a salary to somebody. But right now, um, I think phase one will be I will uh, everything uh, like I'll do the sourcing. I'll find and pay for the item and I will do fulfillment. So the front end and the back end will still be me. I want to make sure I get the right thing at the right price and I want to make sure it gets to the buyer right. 
uh, in, in a timely way and, and that's packaged well. Everything in between, I could hire someone else to do. Eventually, I could push those things also off also and then i could step back into more of like a management of the workers yeah. um, role but yeah I I, it's like, a great idea i feel like that's a, sort of the model for any business in a way um you know i'm a professional producer and can do all i can just like you i can do everything from nuts to bolts on this end of things as far as audio and whatever right. but but that's some of that stuff is just time consuming and sure. it's not super challenging some of it's super challenging and i'm sure like going out finding the stuff can be challenging but some of it's just like hey man once you learn how to ship a box you can ship a box once you learn how to sort of edit to a certain degree you could do that so it's always about finding that tipping point so you know people that are out there listening and like oh, i'm thinking about doing this sometimes it's just a matter of finding the right rhythm and and becoming I, and i'm a firm believer in this you've got to become an expert in what it is that you're doing first or you're not going to be able to actually effectively help others to replicate that because when a problem happens, you need to be able to say, Oh, that's 14 carat or, or whatever there you are in a sense, you're getting paid for your knowledge at that point rather than your grunt work. So it's interesting to hear you talk about it that way. Yeah, definitely. Um, it takes time. It just takes, uh, yeah. it's, it's some of that stuff you can't, you can't even learn by having somebody tell you, you've kind of got to experience it, maybe experience a little bit of the pain associated with a bad move, <laughs> yes. you know, uh, so that you, you remember that, you know, you want to avoid it. Well, I'm a big believer in this. It's something that's, uh, I was a teacher in a formal life and there's a big movement of called failing forward. And we know from all the brain research that we learn far, far more from our failures than we do from our successes. So every little failure we have along the way is something they're like, oh, I remember that and I'm not gonna do that again. So fantastic. All right, yeah. so what are we gonna talk about today on the show, Matt? So today I'm gonna show you one item that's sold. That is the- the name of the of the yes. podcast. I'm going to show you something that's sold. I'm going to tell you about it. But what I really wanted to focus on in this episode, and I'd like to do this periodically, it's fun to, to go all into just items that I've recently bought and sold. We will do that. But I also think that it's fair and maybe helpful if I give some some maybe advice, unsolicited advice, but some advice on ways that maybe if you're doing this, even part-time or full-time, that you can maybe maximize what you can earn or be more efficient because, uh, you know, if you can save time, you're saving money. If you save money, you're saving yourself time and, and all of that stuff is good for your business. So first thing, let me bend down to grab it. First thing I'm going to show you today is uh, this uh, picture frame. And this is, you know, nothing really that special looking if you look at it. So on the front, what you're looking at is a, a frame that can hold two different um, five by seven photographs. And it's got glass there. It's, it's two. So it's hinged in the middle. It can open up and, and shut. It's just made to stand on its own, sit up. It looks like a book. Back. It looks like a book. It opens correct. Yeah, exactly. On the back. It's got this kind of a darkish brown, like felt kind of material that is the backer that would hold the picture or whatever in place. And then these kind of old little hoops that are made out of brass on the back that you are pulls that you would use to pull it up and down. By looking at it, I mean, does it look all that special to you? I mean, just looking at it, it looks like a picture frame. No, and it looks like it's old. It looks old and it's me it's metal. It's got a metal like frame around it. Right. But it's and it's like a silverish color. But if I show it up close, you can see that there's tarnishing um, around on this silver color. It's quite heavy. I mean, it does have glass in it, but it's metal. So the reason I'm showing this is that I bought this last week. It just sold. So it, it, it just from basic appearance, it doesn't look anything all that special. But it turns out that it's made of sterling silver. Oh, so the metal all the way around it is solid silver and it's quite heavy even without the glass in it. So I paid $12 for this at a thrift store. Um, it was a little bit on the high end. And and the reason I was a little bit hesitant in buying it because I had a, I was I was suspicious that this might be silver, but it doesn't have the mark. It doesn't have any branding and it doesn't have a 925 or sterling, anything like that on it. So, but again, $12 is not that bad. I can sell this and make 12. It's it's a vintage. I could I could find a way to kind of describe it in such a way to 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 bring a buyer in. But when I went back and tested it, it turned out sure enough it's sterling silver. Uh sold it for $150. Wow. Because it's silver and it can be it can be polished up really nicely. Um it's you know, you don't come across this very often. But I just kind of wanted to show this to say that 
this is one of those types of items that I think people in thrift stores and antique stores and stuff pass by without giving it a second look. And like if you're shopping for a picture frame, then you're thinking, I need to look for one of a particular size. But if you're not looking for a picture frame, you're looking for deals, you're not expecting that you could find a picture frame for $10 or $12 that can be worth $150 or $200. But if you didn't know, they do make or did, and even still some brands make frames out of solid silver or even solid gold. You can find them. Um, some A lot of times they may not be marked. And so there may be a, there's a risk involved. It's all about how much you are willing to gamble. But this is different than gambling, right? If I go out to uh, the gas station and I'm like, I want a Powerball ticket and I buy it, and then I go home and that night I don't win. I can't go back the next day and say, okay, well, I didn't win. Um, can I get my $2 back? They'll <laughs> laugh at me. But something like this, if I spend $12, if it turns out to be worth silver like this was, I make $150. It was a great risk. Um, and it, it, it turned out well. If I don't, it doesn't go in the trash. I sell it for 12 or 15 or $20. And I make at least my money back, if not a little bit more. So that's uh, having a tangible um item that I do the calculation in my head ahead of time that tells me that if it's this that I want it to be, it's great. If it's only this that is not as valuable, it's still okay. I learn something and I still get my money back and still I might make a little bit of money. And that's, I mean, that that's kind of how I operate with a lot of things that I buy. It's like a risk reward. It depends on how much it costs, that kind of thing. How much time do you think do you spend and I'm sitting there listening to you and I'm like, you walk into the thrift store, you see this. How much time do you think you spend per item, like thinking about that, like running that calculus, business calculus in your head? Oh, I spend a lot more time on things that I can pick out pretty quickly that I have experience with that I think might be valuable. Um, if I pull out my phone to do some research, I might spend a couple of minutes. I don't, I mean, I'll never spend more than five minutes on any, it doesn't matter what it is. Cause I should be able with my, you know, having done it enough to get the information I'm looking for quickly enough. And so I try to move quickly. I mean, in a lot of these thrift stores, there's a line uh, before the door opens. And so, and I'm like, Oh, here's, you know, Bob and here's, you know, Dave. And I know that they come in, you know, Dave goes for the toys, right? He goes straight to the toys and, and Bob, he's, he's a gold buyer. And uh, he doesn't, I know he just keeps it at home. He doesn't even sell it. He's, he's like a trust fund kid. And he just, this is what he does for fun. He's just got unlimited funds. What? Essentially. And so like, yeah. And so I know, I'm like, oh, okay, where am I going first? And these guys are legit. I mean, they will straight up, it's like, they'll, 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 they'll trip you. They'll elbow you. Like they, they want to, they'll chat and it'll be all nice. And the second the door opens, it's like they're cutting They're they're, you know? And so if you, and I don't do that. I mean, I don't, it's not, a, I mean, yes, I make my living at this, but it's not like, if you get in there two seconds before me and you get that bracelet, like, you know, that's a bummer for me, but that's just not how I operate. So I, I try to move quickly. So I try to research things fast because there's other categories of, of items I want to get to and look at. Um, I don't know if I can answer that question with like a specific number, but it varies. It varies. I'm usually no, you pretty think quick. You answered though. it pretty well. I mean, usually I mean, pretty quick. The, 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 the five minute rule sounds about right. I mean, if yeah. you're looking at something and it's like $2 mm -hmm. and you're like, well, it might be worth, you know, X, you're still, even if you lost $2, you just lost $2. Not I'll that also big. say that if I'm not going, if I'm spending a day sourcing and I want to hit 10 places in a day, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. moving quick, right? Because right. I need, I don't want to get hung up someplace. Um, but if I'm, if I'm going to a certain end of the day, if I've got an hour to kill, I'm like, I'll hit this place. I'm not in a rush. I've got no other place to go. So I'm going to spend more time really looking closely um, at, at maybe areas like picture sure. frames that I don't, that I, you know, other days I might completely pass by, um, because the likelihood that I'm going to find the item I just showed you is very, very low. In fact, that's the, that's one of only two sterling silver picture frames that I've come across in the wild, bought and sold in like the last four years. So it's not, wow. it's not as common, but I want people to know that it does exist. So you don't overlook it. Yeah. Okay, should I uh, give a couple yeah. of pieces let's, of advice? Let's, let's launch into here? this. You know, uh, obviously we've said this on every show, but basically our idea is to help people who are. <laughs> I love the image of the dude throwing elbows to get into this thing, but we're oh we're, we're, we're not encouraging throwing of elbows. But what we're really, I think, no. maybe if we if if there was a target audience, it would be people like me or our friends that may, maybe you know they're 
they have a relative that passes and they've got all this stuff, mm-hmm. like just, just general ideas on what you're looking for. So you're going to, we're, we're sort of imparting that wisdom. Uh, I, there's a lot of nuance to this and Matt has been doing this for a long time. He and I have had many conversations. I'm always, and I, I say this sincerely, I am always amazed by his vast reservoir of knowledge on this. So not all of us are going to get there. But vast, uh, unlimited yes. in a way. It's would, just, you keep going. It just, just it never keep ends. Going, you keep filling it up. Anyway, you're like a giant cloud <laughs> uh, storage unit. Anyway, so what do you have for us today? What are you going to impart on us today? All right. Well, you're going to find out that maybe I don't actually have this. Not, maybe I'm just really good at quickly saying something and sure. making it sound believable. Hey, but... If you say it long <laughs> enough and loud enough, people will believe you, Matt. Confidence. That's yeah. what you got to have. Okay. So uh, the first advice is going to be about uh, about a, a tactic or a strategy for buying to maximize what you're gonna you're gonna earn, and it's a simple idea, and I'll talk a bit a little bit about it. But but the advice is is whenever you're able, try to buy things in lots or in groups instead of individually. Okay, the basic idea here is that if you buy one thing like this this picture frame I bought, um, my ability to earn money is is tied directly to one item, and so it's like it's like it's a yes or a no. It's gonna be what I think it is or it's not. And um, I might still be able to make a little bit of money. But if I knew ahead of time I was only going to make $10 on it, I would have passed on it. I was really buying it because I was hoping it was sterling silver, right? So when I go to these antique stores, yard sales, estate sales, and I see a bunch of tools, I see a handful that are, are nice and, and, and I think I can make a good sale on. I don't just pick up those three or five things. I go to the person. I say, hey, like, you got some great stuff here. I'm really interested in these. I'm wondering, though. If you would give me some sort of discount if I buy 20 or 50 mm. or, you know, I bought a big machinist tool chest from the 1800s at an estate sale not long ago, and it was completely full of tools. Mm. And they were like, you know, it's the chest only. And it's full of tools. It had taken me like 20 minutes to remove all the tools. And there were some tools in there. I was like, I was like, well, what, what if I bought, you know, cause the tools were all individually priced and then there's this. So I was like, well, what if I bought, what if I bought it all? You know, what if I just, what if I bought all of it? What's the price then? And I was able to buy it for just a barely more than the the cost of the chest. And I got all the tools in there, right? So if, if I divide that out, like I got each tool for like 95% off of what it would have been if I bought them. And so now when I come back, I don't just have one item or 10 items. I've got a hundred items. Mm-hmm. And so if I, and so in this case, what I do is anytime I buy a lot, I take, I, I evaluate it. I take out the things that will sell, I think the fastest and for the most money first. Now, this is counterintuitive to what a lot of people who buy and sell do or buy who have a trouble with not selling it is that they'll they'll find the valuable thing and then they want to sell the cheaper stuff and they want to keep the nice thing because mm. it's nice and it's valuable. But I do the opposite. I get it out. I want, I want to sell that as fast as possible for the highest amount I can in the first week if I can, if it's an auction cycler right now. Because let's say I spent $100 on 100 tools. If I can find four or five tools, make my $100 back in a week, I have no cost of goods left, but I have 90 items. Mm -hmm. And that's where I make my, I put those up. I don't have to sell them cheaply. I can actually bump up the price, hoping that I I, uh, sell a a couple of them at higher than tip average value. And then I just slowly lower the price over time. So if you have the ability to buy a lot, do that because you're the, the, the value of that, the the money you're going to get back is leveraged across multiple things. And that helps you, that helps you because um, it gives you options with with how you sell and it also um can help you build up inventory quickly so buy things in groups if things are out list individually ask if they'll give you a discount see if you can buy stuff i i buy entire i've bought an entire room worth of things at thrift stores before i've bought an entire antique store before um and i went from no storage to needing like six storage units (laughs) in a weekend and and it it definitely worked out. Like I made more money by doing that. It was more work and I had to put an extra money into to rent storage space, but it's still like the value is there. So buy lots if you can. Does that make let sense? Me, yeah. Let me ask you a question. So you look at a lot, you're a very skilled reseller. You look at a lot and you see an item that you assume it's probably pretty valuable, but it's within this bigger lot of tools or whatever it is. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter. Um, you know, our last show was on pocket watches, but it's a big lot of stuff. And do you ever do a do you ever do a situation where you don't want to say, "Hey, that's really valuable." In fact, I'll just buy all this stuff because you know, whatever. I'll make my. But with the intent that you're trying to get that one item without them knowing that it's really valuable. 
Yeah. Um, I don't know if I have a particular strategy necessarily other than just to say, like, let's say sometimes I buy these little bags of broken jewelry. It's already discounted because it's pieces that are broken and they want $3 or $5 for it. I look in there and it's mostly broken. Most people say it's just trash. Like why, why is it, are they even trying to sell that? Why not just throw it away? Um, I'll look and I'll see a piece that looks like it's silver. Or I see a piece that looks like it might be gold filled to me. That's enough. It's $3. I could, if that one piece is where is what I think it is just that one piece, I can make money on this. That's an obvious buy. I buy it. Whether that works out or not, I got the rest of the things I sell on and make it. If I find, if I go out and meet with somebody and they've got some jewelry, like I've bought private jewelry collections from people before, and I'm looking at stuff, there's a combination of costume jewelry and, and gold jewelry. I know that the gold jewelry is more valuable. I know it's going to sell faster for more money. The costume jewelry, though, it is valuable. But I, I focus on the, co on the gold jewelry because that's what people would think I would do. And also, I kind of want to act like I'm not that interested in the costume jewelry. Like, I'm really interested in the gold. So... If they're like, what's well, this price for that? It's this price for this. And I think, well, you know, what What if I bought all of these? Can I get a discount? They'll give me a discount on all of the gold jewelry. Great. I'm already in a good place. And then I say, well, you know, hey, these are kind of nice too. Like, well, what if we just did all of it? <laughs> then they give, then I get all of it in at an, and another discount. So it ends up being like I could sell one or two pieces of the gold jewelry, make all my money back. I've still got some gold pieces and I've got all the costume jewelry. And that's where I'm really going to make my profit. So, um, you know, I'm not actually asking them. I'm not giving them a price. I mean, well, I, this is only worth this, and and uh, you know, I I'm only going to pay this. I usually just say, you know, what what could you do? I want them to. This is kind of counterintuitive, like the whole idea of negotiating on prices that you're supposed to put the first number out there because the price that ends up being what you decide on is usually closer to the first number that's discussed than any other number. So. You know, that's why a lot of times people will lowball people. I don't want to offend them. I know it has value. So what do you think? And then they give a number and I say, okay, um, that's totally fair. Um, but what if I added this to it? Then what? And I kind of let them, I want both of us to be happy at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, so I'm not the biggest haggler. Um, I don't think that that's why people would 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 follow me. And, and you could take this advice and then you can be even more hardcore about how you negotiate than I do. You might yeah. make more money, but it has worked well with me. And I've, I've maintained a lot of relationships by, by kind of my strategy here. Yeah. And if I imagine that if you're going in there and you're just basically, you know, playing hardball at every single person you run into and you're, it's like any business they're they're just going to look at you as that person. They're not, I mean, there has to yep. be some give and take. It seems. I go to the same places too. So like they know me by name. Now I don't want them talking about me with like oh you this guy he's just like oh when he comes right. in I just I know it's the same old thing I don't I want them to like be like oh you know Matt's here it he 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 buys stuff here all the time great I'm probably gonna sell some I I want it to be like that yeah um, and okay, you're more so likely gonna get someone that's gonna if they find something that they think you might be interested in they might steer it towards you rather than the guy that's the the jerk. oh man lots of opportunities have opened up as a result of that, just even talking with other customers. I've had times when I'm having a conversation with a worker or a manager about a thing. They know me, blah, blah, blah. It comes up that I buy and sell. And then the person's like, well, you know, I have some stuff at my house that I need to sell, or I just got some things that you would, do you ever do that with? Yeah, I do. I help people sometimes. They give me their phone number or, or I get, they get mine. And then I end up going and buying a bunch of stuff from them. And it's just because I had a conversation. Now, if I had been haggling on a $5 item to get it for $2, walked out the door, I lost out on that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. So, Sometimes it's better to make the long-term play than the short-term play. Yes. Sure. This is a marathon. I mean, if I'm going to do this long-term, this is a marathon. This isn't a sprint. You know, it's right. not just about this month or this year. So, right. okay. So that's about buying stuff and that maybe that's too obvious. Um, now I'm going to talk about a couple of sales strategies, and I sell primarily on eBay. Probably 85% of what I sell is on eBay. So um, one thing I'm going to say about eBay is I recommend that people who have things in their store, whether you have two items or 10,000 items, is that you weekly, if not more often than that, go into your store and take all of your items out of the store, like delist them. Don't delete delete them. They're still there, but delist them. Take them from being live to being saved, essentially. And then go back in, and then instead of hitting relist, click the button that says sell similar item. What happens is, and you can do this with 200 items at a time, like bulk delist them and bulk relist them. 
The reason you want to do that is that every day, every hour, every minute, people are, other people across the world are listing things, the same thing you have or in the same category you have. And so like if I list this thing and then 10 more come in right after me and then 10 more after that, and then eventually after a month or weeks, months, my stuff is way down. And that's not the stuff that's popping up as the new items that have been listed mm. when people are searching for this. So if you delist it, if you were to relist it, that doesn't actually work because there is a number assigned to your listing. Oh. And if you relist it, it's going to relist it with that same number. It's going to go back to the same queue. But if you hit sell similar, it essentially copies it perfectly. There's no change in it. It copies it exactly. It just assigns it a new number. So then when you relist that or you sell similar, you list that item, now it's going to pop up at the front of the queue. So anybody who is searching for uh, someone like yourself who really loves antique uh, stick pins, oh, will be, yeah. you know, they'll be searching antique stick pin, 14 karat gold stick pin. And if yours has been in there for six months, they're probably not going to find yours unless they're combing through page after page after page. But if you pop it up first thing in the morning, then the first, you know, they're going to get, uh, if they're following that, it notifies them, hey, this the new items that you're looking for are here. And I do this about every two to three days, but I have multiple stores with multiple thousands of items. And so I don't want any of those getting lost. So I have a bunch to rotate through. And very frequently, I will do that in the morning. I'll relist 200 items and I'll get five, eight sales that day. I did nothing differently. I had it. I didn't change anything. I just delisted it, sold, you know, copied it, sell similar, put it back in. And you get, and I, and I know that this works for other people too, because I've given this recommendation on the Rusty the Reseller channel and I had comment after comment saying, I just, I didn't know that I just did this. I just got two sales today. Thank you. <laughs> you know? Um, so that's yeah, it's cool. It's an economies of scale thing, right? Ultimately uh, eBay or whatever site you're selling it on there, there are 7.5 billion people in the world. So you, you really only need to find the one person that wants the item, but if they never see it, you're you're trying to get yourself to the top of the queue so that the the, per, the one person out of the seven billion sees it, and that's a really great piece of advice. Yeah, I hope it helps people. I mean, that's it's an easy thing. It's a few clicks. It just takes a few seconds, and you don't actually have to do any work, any additional work. It's just you're refreshing stuff into the into the platform so that that people who are interested in the item will see it and then they can make a decision at that moment. So that's one. the The last piece of advice I have today is if you're going to resell full-time, uh, it even works if you're part-time, is, uh, and this is an old, you know, phrase, is that not, you know, put all your eggs in one basket. So what I'm going to say is you should find multiple avenues uh, where you can sell items. Don't get on and just sell in one store on eBay. And I'll, and, and I'll tell you, from my experience, I have three, currently three active eBay stores. I have an Etsy store. I sell on Facebook Marketplace, and I sell at a couple of antique stores uh, in my region. I do that because, first of all, you're reaching more people because some people just want to shop on Etsy. And they don't shop on eBay or vice versa. So you're getting a catchment of different buyers. Having things uh, at an antique store for me is nice because alternatively from having them out to sell, I would have to pay for a storage unit to, to hold them because I've got a, a lot of items, like more than I can hold at my own home. So I'm going to have to spend money just storing them. I would rather spend that same amount of money and have them available for people to see and buy every single day. So to me, that makes sense. I can make money and I'm not even there. All I have to do is list it. I put it out there. So I've got, I, I sell in Marketplace and there so that I can get local buyers to buy things who are seeing it in person. Yeah. Then I have other things online reaching millions of people potentially all over the world. The number one reason that I say sell in multiple places is because unless you're selling something and you're entirely in control of that whole process, meaning it's in your hand, and you're doing whatever you're doing to advertise or market it, and you're reaching out to them, and they're seeing it person, and the whole transaction is with you, and that nobody can interrupt that. Unless that's you, you need to have some fail-safes in, in place in case whatever other platform or thing that you're using does something that messes up your business. Now, let me give you an example. I have three eBay stores for very one very simple reason, and that is eBay can make decisions with regards to the things that you're selling or the way that you are behaving in your interactions with a buyer or a seller, and they can place limitations 
of varying levels, or they can completely shut your store down without really warning, without explanation, and there's not a whole lot of recourse that you have. So about a year and a half ago, I had put some little carved figurines on my eBay store that were made out of bone. I, I come across jewelry all the time that is carved out of usually bovine bone. This was just a thing that, that a type of substance that you can use and you can carve out of and that sort of thing. So these are little figurines. I know that they're bone. I put them on. I say that they're carved bone <laughs> on there, which is, is uh, there's no policies against selling that. Uh, on eBay. And I put up four different listings of individual ones. So I had four of them. Instead of selling them as a lot, I put them four up individually. Okay. I get an email from eBay saying that they had taken my listing down because it violated a policy uh, regarding the sale of um, ivory. So for some reason, somebody found that or and believed that what I was selling was actually ivory and not bone, which ivory is illegal to sell. They've, they've got... Um, laws in place to to prevent the you know obviously the killing of of the animals and the harvesting of that so you can't sell that legally i know that and it said please do not do the do not relist this do not sell any more items like that and i think oh, okay well that's a bummer i probably need to go in and take the other ones down it's not a big deal to me it was like i mean i think i had them each up on auction for like ten dollars each so it wasn't i mean i sell things for multiple thousands of dollars on my ebay store this was not i wasn't trying to sneak an ivory piece in you know uh mm -hmm. so i go in before i've even been able to take the other two down i get another email they've taken down another one of my listings and from ebay's perspective i violated a policy even though they were incorrect on it and that even though they had sent me an indication that i should turn you know stop doing that i tried to do it again I didn't actually list another item. It was already listed, right? So they thought that I went against their their advice and did it again. So they placed a limitation on my uh, eBay store, which meant from that point on, I couldn't list anything in that category of any sort of carved item. I also couldn't ever again in the store list items and use any of the words that I had used in that listing. Oh. And here are some words I used. Vintage antique, carved, jewelry. Now, I've just described 95 plus percent of words that I use in every listing because that's what I sell is antiques and collectibles. So they put a limitation. I contacted eBay. I couldn't get any budging. They said, this is not ever going to lift either. Like this is, this is on your account now. You can never use these again, which I had like 2,500 items in that store which no longer, they, I, I, they like, I couldn't be live. I, I had to adjust the words if I wanted to sell them. But see, if I take out these words, I'm not catching the buyers that I'm looking for because they're searching with those terms. So overnight, I had the, the primary avenue to earn income. And all of a sudden, I can't, I can't have those sold anymore on that. So I ended up having to open another eBay store Refot like rephotograph and relist thousands of items oh. because of a limitation that they put in, and it wasn't even something I'd done wrong. They they were wrong. They thought I was selling something that was this different than what I had, and there was no recourse for me. Yeah, After they're that looking happened, at it numbers, right? I mean, they're saying, they're looking at numbers, "Hey, yep. listen, you know, we, it, he may be whatever the recourse issue. They're basically protecting themselves legally, and they don't care if they're mm -hmm. right or not. They're just saying it's not worth it to oh, yeah. even take it's a chance." To, to, yeah, to have one, to have one, like even if this buyer or the seller leaves our platform, like it's it's still worth it for us to not have that liability, potential liability. I understand that to to a point, but uh, you know, and we can get into that. But my my point is, you never know when someone, for a valid reason or an incorrect reason, is going to place some do something that will dramatically thwart your efforts to earn income. And this is my primary form of income. This is how I pay my bills. So I was stressed out. I had to, I had to hustle. I now have three stores, three eBay stores, because if something happens in one store, I got two other active stores that don't have those limitations. And I can move things into those. I'm also building up each store to have thousands of items in each store and um, various types of items. So that if I ever have to pivot from one, it's not the same pain point that I experienced the first time. Um, and I have things, you know, if something have eBay can entirely shut this down, I still got Etsy and I still got local until I build something else. So mm -hmm. I would say to protect yourself, to insulate yourself from potential things that can happen, COVID, 
you know, things shut down. You can't go out and source, you know, have, have other avenues by which you can make uh, your, your income from, because if one gets shut down, you don't want to be in a tough spot. Yeah, that is great, man. Just amazing. Yeah. It's funny. eBay, we will do a whole show on eBay or more. It's such a fascinatingly. <laughs> sure. I have a love hate relationship. With yeah. It, for sure. it's, it's a Byzantine model for sure. But um, you know how, with how complicated it is, but that's a good way to stop. So um, we will, uh, be back with another show uh, in the next couple of days. Yeah. But we are grateful that you are listening to us. Again, if you have any questions, please email us at the what's old podcast at gmail.com. It's just what's old podcast at gmail.com. Um, and, and ask us questions. We'd love to have it. Remember to subscribe, like all those fun things. But otherwise, yep. Matt, any last words before we head out of here? No, just check out the uh, the YouTube channels, Rusty the Reset. We just put two videos out in the last week, uh, both on jewelry, one on costume jewelry and one on fine jewelry. And uh, I'm happy to say they are the most successful videos we've done in four years. Awesome. So um, apparently they're good enough. People are liking them. So you might want to check them out. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, have a great week, Matt. Take care. 